coming up on One Central Florida. It's play ball, but these guys play by the old rules. Then, you may know it as a town where the villages started, but Lady Lake's history began in the late 19th century. Also, it's a place of dreams. This Orlando facility is changing the lives of special kids. And this Sorrento farmer made the move to a smaller breed of bovines. All that and more on this edition of One Central Florida. The history of America's favorite pastime is captured in museums across the nation. But no one demonstrates the game's beginnings better than Central Florida vintage ball players themselves. This is a gentleman's game. First rule is no cursing, no swearing. Today we're playing what we call vintage baseball. We play either 1860s rules or 1880s rules. Our teams are equipped with the equipment of that time period as well as the uniforms. Playing at the Needham Railers today. Never played them, don't know what we're up against. I love how just raw it is. It's, it's how baseball began. There is no manual for vintage baseball. Players do their own research to keep the game true to history. We pitch underhand. We don't wear gloves. We didn't have gloves back in the day. The biggest challenge is learning how to field without a glove. It was definitely more of a fielder's glory sort of game. During the Civil War, the soldiers' way of getting some R&R &R was to play baseball. They play in prison camps, in their own unions, Confederate camps. Once the war ended, people migrated down the South and they brought the game with them. Well, I've done a lot of research with newspapers and I've just found the team that was out of City Point, which is over by Titusville. We liked the name because it was awkward and we're pretty much an awkward team with our different levels of skill. The other old team I found from Orlando was called the Fat Man. I didn't think we'd like to play under that name. Awkward seemed to suit us. The game's historic appeal attracts other reenactors of the era. That's a Carger! Carger! Well run! We're from Central Florida, so we're rooting for the awkwards. I heard about this vintage baseball group, so I thought it would be a really good opportunity to come out and watch the game. Put some steam on it! The vintage equipment used is mostly handmade. Ted makes baseballs and by chance found a nearby bat maker to supply the bats. Jeremy and I made a wrong turn and drove by his house. His mailbox had bats as the stand, so we just decided to stop in his house. The worst he's gonna tell us is get off my property, so. As soon as we saw his lathe and equipment, we just ordered bats right away for the teams. One old style bat, vintage. Besides the mix of skill levels, vintage baseball also welcomes gentlemen of all ages. I love baseball. Well, I started when I was about 10 years old playing baseball can't move very well anymore, but he needed an extra hand, so I thought I'd come out and catch an inning or two. Where are you playing today? I'll probably be playing either third short. It's a little different, it's a little fun, and now my son's a player on this team as well. I decided to go to the vintage baseball practice, see what it was like. I've never played before, I've watched him play. I loved it, it was a lot of fun. You got this, you're in, man, you're in, you're in, you're in. Standing up, standing up, standing up, standing up. After a heated game, the awkwards take home the victory. But neither team forgets why they play. Good game, man. You're there to play a gentlemanly game. <laughs> the guys are really playing for the heart. And because it's so different, it's so enjoyable, it's competitive, but yet it's fun at the same time. This is pure baseball. Um, there's no drugs or steroids or anything like that involved. There's no money involved. We just come out here and have fun. I've lived in Lady Lake all my life. Some of my favorite memories of Lady Lake are swimming in the lakes and you knew everybody and by the same token everybody knew you and there was no way to get away with anything if you were a kid. 
because everybody knew my dad. Lady Lake, population 13,000, is located in the northwest corner of Lake County. Known probably more as the city that contains part of the villages, its history goes back to the late 19th century. When the railroad came through the area in 1883, it attracted settlers like the Sly family. Sam Sly moved his family here and located across the street and had a store and he had you know, some other produce businesses and his family houses. And then he also built a three-story, three-star type hotel at that time, and it was behind the train depot. Early residents fought a plan by the railroad to name the town Cooper after one of their employees, but instead named it for the lake near the center of town. Now the history of that lake is it got named by Indian folklore, and it was because uh, supposedly a white young lady was found by the Indians dead in the lake, and they called it Lady Lake. Farming, cattle, and citrus drove the economy of the new town. Several doctors stand out in early Lady Lake history. In 1886, Dr. Newton Stevens proposed a plan to beautify the city. His idea was to plant oak trees all along the, the roads. Of course, they were small dirt roads, and they put up these grand oak trees, and he put in tons of oak trees, and you'll see them all around. Up Lady Lake Boulevard is the famous area because there the oak trees hang over into a, like a cathedral arch with the Spanish moss, and it's very picturesque. Probably the most famous resident was the first female doctor licensed in Florida, Dr. Swan. She went all through the area and went and visited people and Indians and families and took care of them. Lady Lake remained a small agricultural town until the mid-1980s, when a real estate developer named Harold Schwartz decided to build a retirement community in the area called The Villages. They just bought that land that was in Lady Lake and they developed across the highway. And to do that, to get from the mobile park across the highway, they actually built a bridge. And then they built their first town square in Lady Lake called Spanish Springs. The Villages now extends far beyond Lady Lake, sometimes overshadowing the town's small historic downtown. Lady Lake's historic museum is in the town's original train depot and the general store dating from 1926, now a thrift store, is across the street. Some of the early houses and buildings, unfortunately, are gone. Most of ours burnt down or were torn down for development. They just followed along with this growth in the villages and, you know, wanted to grow. If you're going to go forward, then you have to come up with something that the economy will support the community. And that's what they did. You feel safe. It's a very low crime rate, taxes are low, um, wonderful properties, lots of nice houses and uh, wonderful businesses. So that's grown by leaps and bounds. Everybody should come and visit. It's a great place to, uh, to be. If you're, if you're interested in a small town America, this is the heart of it. Coming up on One Central Florida, Central Florida special needs kids come here to realize their dreams. Also, a day on the farm in Sorrento and its many residents. Zach Marks is a young entrepreneur from Melbourne Beach who found success as a teenage web designer. I love making videos, I like working on the website, creating graphics, so yeah, I definitely say that I think I'm successful. When he was just 11 years old, Zach started building a kid-friendly social media site he called Grom Social. We have over 4 million kids on the website, we have over 530-something employees working for Grom Social. The idea for Grom Social came when Zach's father banned him from using Facebook. Me and my dad got into a pretty big argument uh, why I wasn't allowed to have a Facebook account. I said, well, what if I create my own Facebook for kids, and he said, well, good luck with that. Zach Marks is the founder of a social media website for kids. Grom Social, what is this social network that you came up with? 47,000 kids joined Grom in the first nine days, and it grew exponentially from there. Since then, each day teaches Zach something new. Traveling as much as I do, like there's so much stuff that I learn every single day, just working on the company, it's, it's insane. Politics, business, money, what's it even like to go public? Zach Marks, 
One to Know in Central Florida. Go down to the toy. You see the toys in down there at the other end? Physical therapy is okay. difficult. I mean, adults don't like physical therapy. You're using muscles that haven't been used or have to right. be used in a certain way. Yay for Kylie! Yay. Amy Gomes is a pediatric physical therapist who has a passion for those with special needs. I wanted to be a physical therapist since I was the age of 10. <laughs> A few years ago, I went to a physical therapy conference and I found this neurologist who had cerebral palsy herself. And as she started talking about staying active as children get older and out of therapy, that just perked my interest, like, oh, that would be great if we could do something like that. Good job, big girl Kylie. And because my son had always wanted to open an ice rink, I remember calling him and saying, how about if we try to put our dreams together? She kind of merged the idea of, of fitness center for those with disabilities and ran with it, kind of grew into this, this huge thing that would be able to serve a lot of different people. That idea became the Central Florida Dreamplex, a fitness facility designed for those with special needs. We need to keep kids active up into their teen and adult years. That's what we're here for, to be accessible to those who would struggle otherwise in a, in a typical setting. We started off very, very, very slow, maybe 10 or 12 sessions. That was a good day. And now we see between 50 and 75 kids a day here. A child with cerebral palsy or autism or Down syndrome doesn't participate real well in a typical ballet class, a typical taekwondo, a typical gymnastics class. So ours are geared to help have one-on-one -on -one if they need it. It's like getting therapy twice. To them, it's just fun or having a class. Good! And the progress I've seen in my kids is just, there's no, there's no comparison. Progress and understanding is exactly what Amy hopes to achieve by teaching the community about disabilities, as well as provide a safe place for everyone to come and have fun. It's a great way to meet new people like this and be part of the team and not have to worry about, oh, I messed up, I just get right back up and try it again. It is open arms to everybody. And Kaylee has learned to interact with everyone from Down syndrome to autistic. And it's important because we live in a world that is not so inclusive outside. And here, we're always accepted. And it makes a world of difference when you know that you have some place like that that you can come to. One, two, yes, yes. perfect. <laughs> The whole community will, will absolutely benefit from this facility. Not only do they get to play in it and have fun in it, but I think that we'll just come together as a community that everybody's welcome, everybody can have fun. <laughs> I love what I do, and I'm very fortunate and blessed to be able to get up and do what I love to do. That's it. This is Cinnamon, and that's her little baby right there, that's Cinnamon Sugar. Come here, Cinnamon. We've had cows for years, but in the last uh, about oh, 10 years or so, we've started focusing on miniature cattle. He's a real nice animal. It's kind of, kind of typical of what we raise. You see the big hump? And this is at less than two years of age. They already have a hump like that. We raise uh, miniature zebus that are in the 32, so this is, this is probably about 36 inches tall right here, down to, uh, so down to like maybe 32 inches tall. <laughs> you have to kind of be careful with the longhorns. And we've raised Texas longhorns since about 1994. But about six years ago, we started focusing on miniature longhorns. But you can see they're, they're larger than the, than the zebu, 
but they're very, very small for full-size cows. Think about a normal full-size cow might be this tall. They still have all the colors and the huge horns of the big, of the full-size longhorns, but they're just a lot less work. Both miniature zebu and miniature longhorns are easier on the pastures. They don't tear the ground up. They, they don't need the six-foot tall fences. Um, if you look at Emerald's horns there, that's a, a pretty nice set of horns on a tiny animal. But you can easily keep a nice little small herd of miniatures and you can have them as companion animals, as pets, but they're also utilitarian. You're also, they're good beef. Uh, you can milk them. We've sent them all over, the, literally all over the United States, California, Colorado, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, um, lots to Texas. One of my favorite things to do is sell Texas Longhorns back to Texas. I love when people drive out here from Texas with their Texas plates and load up miniature Texas Longhorns and haul them back to Texas. I, I get a little, a little bit of a kick out of doing that.